So uh, the, all your homework uh, and bonus assignments uh, due dates are right here. And everything's posted except for this last bonus survey five, which I'll post uh, tomorrow. And the study guide is now posted with its key on the exam schedule page, so you can start studying for that. S use that to study for the final, which is really just an exam three. So it's just an hour and a half long, and uh, it just covers um, the material uh, from chapters uh, post-exam three, so 42 to 56. And I'll post a practice exam and key tomorrow, and that's one you should try as a regular, a real exam. So you study from, study from this, and as much as possible, don't look at that key, but uh, this is a very good study guide, and then try the practice exam without any notes as usual. I keep saying that, but uh, people keep not following that advice, and believe me, it really helps. All right, so that's and next week. We're going to have regular office hours, including office hours on uh, reading day. I haven't decided exactly when those will be, but uh, they'll probably be in the afternoon, 2 to 3.30 as usual uh, on Thursday. Instead of, uh, like today, our usual office hours are 12.30 to 2 on Thursdays, but uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they're in the afternoon from 3.30 to 5. Is that what I said? 3.30 to 5? So we'll, I said 2 to 3.30. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have to talk to the TAs and I'll let you know. But sometime in the afternoon on reading day. Other than that, office hours are as usual. And any questions before we start? What is reading day? What? What is reading day? Reading day is Thursday, I mean like a week from today. I mean like what do you do like on reading day? What do we do on reading day? Reading day is for you to read and study. It's your one study day. You're not supposed to have any classes, but I'll still have office hours. Now, you're, f you know, for people who want to study and you have some questions, okay? And you guys in the in-person class, your final is on Tuesday of finals weeks, and uh, in the online, it's on Friday, the last Friday, the 20th. All right, any other questions before we start today? All right, so let's just finish up logistic regression. We're going to do uh, inference for logistic regression. And let's go to the document camera and get this focused here. Okay, so uh, inference for logistic regression is almost identical to inference for ordinary regression. Okay, in both cases, the first step is going to do the overall test for the collective effect of all the betas. We're looking at inference for logistic, multiple logistic regression here. So our null is that all the uh, betas, all the slopes in front of the x's, we're not talking about the intercepts, but the slopes in front of the x's right here are zero. That they're all zero. There's nothing in our model, in the population, right? In the population, these slopes in front of the x's are all zero. Our model tells us nothing. And our alternative is, uh-uh, that we have some signal in here, um, and at least one of those betas is non-zero. Okay, so that's the idea. And then in ordinary regression, ordinary linear least squares regression, we could use, we had a quantitative y, right? You know, we were predicting things like exam scores. So what we could use was either a chi-square or an f-test. You know, we have multiple slopes, cause, so we can't use a Z or a T. Um, but we could use uh, an F, we used an F test for small samples, and then we said is when um, N got big enough, we could use a chi-square test. We could do either of those. But now we're predicting a 0, 1 Y variable. We're basically predicting counts, counts, 
or percents, like right, the percent, instead of your score on an exam, let's say the percent of you who get an A on the exam. So we're predicting one if you got an A, zero if you didn't, success or failure. Zero, one. And for uh, predicting counts, we never use F tests because why? Because we always use F and T's when we have unknown standard deviations. But when you're predicting counts, you can get the standard deviation directly from the count. For example, if our sample data said that looked like 50% of you got an A, Okay, 50%. Well, directly from that 50%, it's a count, how many people got A's, and 50% of you did. And then I could say, okay, right from that, that not only tells me the mean, that 50% of you, the you know, half of you did, but it also tells me the standard deviation, right? Because all I have to do is say, you know the standard deviation would be P times 1 minus P, and then you take the square root of that which would be a half. So with all the, so, um, so the probability distribution, including the standard devi deviation, is determined directly from the predicted counts. That's how it is for a chi-square test. That's unlike F or T tests, which remember estimate those standard deviations. That's why we have those degrees of freedom based on how many, the sample size minus how many parameters. That's all because we're estimating standard deviations from the variation in our sample and not from the predicted mean itself. The predicted mean tells you nothing, like from doing an ordinary uh, least squares regression and I, the sample data says that maybe the average was 80% score on the exam, that doesn't tell me anything about the shape of the distribution or the standard deviation, okay? So uh, point being that we're not going to use these Fs. Uh, we never use F tests here. We're just going to be using something, we're going to be using the chi-square distribution. And we did this before with simple uh, we showed how it's very similar to a chi-square test. Okay, now the probability, uh, let's see. Now what about the degrees of freedom? The degrees of freedom are just like we've had before for chi-squared. It's uh, the number of x's or the number of parameters in the model, the number of these little b's, parameters, including the intercept, minus one. Okay, so that's, why don't we write this down so you remember? Um, And the degrees of freedom are equal to, just like as usual, the number of parameters minus one. So these are the parameters. That's the same, there's one intercept, so that's the same as the number of x's in your model. All right, now, um, what else do we need to talk about here? Let's see. Um, and then what about, then what we're gonna do is after we do this, overall test for the collective effect of all the slopes for just, just like we usually do, then we're going to say if, if we reject the null, we reject this null that they're all equal to zero, we reject that, then we know at least one of the slopes is non-zero, and then the next step is to test those individual slopes. And to do that, with ordinary regression, we used an F or a T, but now, excuse me, we used a T or a Z, or an F. But now, we're going to just use the z. I and mean, we could use a chi-squared, but we're just going to use the z. We can't, point being, you can't use t or f's for the same reason that I just explained here, because you just don't do those for counts. We, didn't, we never did it when we had percent problems, right? Because we know the standard deviation. We don't need another... We don't have to use the variance of the sample. Okay, so there, that's important too. You never use t-tests, which, which makes things simpler. You don't have to worry about that, those degrees of freedom. 
Okay, so then what is this difference between, um, what's the difference between the um, ordinary and logistic regression? It's how we estimate these betas in the model, how we estimate those. And instead of um, doing our usual least squares, where we take the sum of the squared residuals, we estimate them by a maximum likelihood estimate, which maximizes the likelihood of getting our sample data. Now, with ordinary least squares, these two things are the same. So it really doesn't matter which way you do it. You've probably, if you take step 400, I'm sure that's probably one of the things you've proved. But for re logistic regression, they're not the same. So we can't do, we're not gonna be doing least squares. We're gonna be maximizing the likelihood and using this deviance table, the same as minimizing the deviance. And if you want to, if those of you who are more interested in the math behind this, you should read, um, if you're interested, see uh, week 13, where we explain it in our free R course. It's on our uh, homepage and go to the lessons page and go to week 13 and it will be all explained. Plus you can learn R really in depth if anybody wants to for free. It's just the course that used to go along with this course before, um, before I revised this course. Okay, so now uh, it just deals with the second half of this course. It doesn't deal with all the stat 100 stuff. All right, so now um, we already looked at this deviance table. You can turn the page right here. We've done that. We already looked at this. And we saw how we're going to really, even though we're not, we're going to get, it looks just like an ANOVA table, but it's really an analysis of deviance. This is the analysis of deviance. And what we said was that and here's like, it, it looks just like our ANOVA. Here's the sum of squares for the model. Right here, this is our deviance. And this, we said, is distributed with, as n gets large, as a chi-square. And that's why we're using this right here. With two degrees of freedom, why? Because we're going back to that example that we just finished up last time that had two predictor variables. We're trying to predict whether somebody, a zero one variable, getting into med school or not, based on your gender and what? Your biological science score, okay? Remember that these predict, this is our, this is our, we have three betas here, right? Three of them. So our parameters are equal to three. That means our degrees of freedom parameters equal to three. That means our degrees of freedom are two. That's why this is P minus one. It's the same in this little chart. This is from our data program. I also write the number of X's because those are the same. We just don't count the intercept, okay? And it's distributed as a chi-square as N gets big and the limit it is, okay? So now what we're going to do is do a chi-squared test then on uh, first the overall, to test the overall, we're going to do a chi-squared test, and then we are going to test these individual slopes with Z, and they're already done for you here, and we're going to build confidence intervals. They're already done. We're just going to see where these come from, okay? Let me just make sure I covered everything on this page. All right. Um, we talked about why we do these likelihood procedures. We didn't really talk about how for continuous x variables, for continuous x variables, um, think about how problematic it would be to um, do least squares on the log odds. It, uh, you know, a continuous th uh, x would give you for your observed why you're always going to get a one or a zero, right? We s that's all there is. The y's are always one or zero. So when we put it into the log odds form, we'd have what? We'd have the log of zero, 
which is negative infinity, or we'd have the log of 1 over 0, which would be positive infinity. So our log odds pr would be, um, how could you minimize the squared error of these predicted log odds? It would be like trying to fit a bunch of infinities with the least squares line. It wouldn't really work at all. So what people do, you, you might think, is what you do, and what we did do when I showed it on the data program, was group them, right? Do these groupings. Don't use the ac all the actual y's and minimize their errors, but group them so we get the percentage within any vertical strip, right, within any grouping, the percentage of uh, ones. We could do that. Then we wouldn't have to fit a bunch of infinities. But uh, then our fitting results would depend on how we do that binning, how we do those that, and it would it messes things up. Um, and the other problem is we could try to just minimize these observed ones and zeros minus these um, predicted, you know. Uh, once we bend them, but um, it just, as we saw before, it would just fit in the cent middle of the data. We really are interested in the ends here. Um, it wouldn't be sensitive to the uh, very low probabilities and the very high probabilities. If you think about it, for rare events, if you, um, here you're trying to, you'd, I'm not sure if you're interested in this, but you'd see that you know, for like probabilities of just one out of a hundred versus, how we have, what do we have here, one out of ten to the fifth, it's, it looks, when you, it's not going to make much difference, but look, it's, you know, it's so much more likely to get a one if your probability is one out of a hundred rather than one out of ten to the fifth. So, um, doing a maximum likelihood ma uh, is very sensitive to those extreme values and fits all the data, not just the data in the center. Long story shor short, uh, you can read a lot more about it if you go to this lessons page if, you, if you're interested. But for now, we've got enough tools, and I think you've got the intuition to go ahead and proceed. So that's what we're going to do. So here we are, and um, what we're going to do. Okay. So we're looking at this, and um, here's our fitted model right here for our sample data. And we're going to, we want to, so what, let's state our null. We're going to do the overall test. So H naught is what? That even though in the sample we have non-zero betas, we're not interested in this one, we're just interested in these two, even in the sample, they're not zero. Our null is that in the population, the whole population, imagine a wider population, that both of those, this is beta 1, excuse me, this is B1 and B2 from our sample, and we're estimating, we're saying in the population, the beta 1 and beta 2 are really zero. We just, these are small and just due to the luck of the draw. And our alternative is, this is our usual null and alternative that we always do, and our alternative is what? That, no, in, in the population, our alternative is that at least one of those is equal to zero. So in the population, the null is always, the, for the, the strict null is for the collective effect of all these slopes. And um, so let me just write this out, just to make sure, you, it's what we always do. It's in the population, the slopes are all zero. That means that no matter what gender you are or what your biological science score is, it makes no difference in you getting into med school. Now that seems crazy with the biological science score, and we're going to reject this. I just want to show you the test. Um, we just happen, the idea is that we just happen 
to observe non-zero slopes due to chance variation. You're not going to get exactly zero, so these slopes are small and just due to chance. Okay, and that the alternative is, uh-uh, it's not due to chance. It's because in the population, one of them really is not zero. Okay, these are too big. And look, we've already done the test and the p-values are so small. These are too big to be due to chance variation. So we assume this null, like we always do. We assume the null, and we say that when the null is true, the chi this test statistic, our chi-square statistic, follows a particular distribution that with two degrees of freedom, so this is our, let's, we've got these two degrees of freedom here, and we've got this statistic here. That's our chi-square stat, and that's our degrees of freedom, okay? And now we know that it's going to look something like, when the null is true, it's going to look something like this, all right? Like, it's not going to be symmetrical. This is the distribution of the chi-square statistic when the null is true. So when the null is true, if you remember, the mean is about 2, and we got this huge chi-square statistic. So let's just look at our chart to refresh our memory for the chi-square, and you'll have this on your exam. Here it looks more symmetrical because it's showing one with higher, more degrees of freedom. But for two degrees of freedom, it's pretty asymmetrical. And here it shows for 5%, if we wanted to do a 5% cutoff, we just need a chi-square beyond 5.99. If we want to do a 1%, it would be beyond this. But look, ours is 29.33. Um, so it's that's even bigger than this one, okay? So we can draw that. It's basically off the page, and I can't make it go down small enough. You know, basically there's almost no area. Here is our chi-square statistic. Right here. This one that we got. It's the same thing. And that's why our p-value is so tiny. It's less than 0 0.005. It's almost zero. Okay, that's why our p-value is so small. And if you didn't, um, and you could compare it to, and on the chart, this is 29.33. That's our chi-square. We could compare it to those critical values we just saw. At 5% critical value, we had something like, this is, let's say, this was at, um, when I said all this area is 5%, we had a critical value, I'll put a little star, of 5.99. And our, we're well beyond that. And then we even said at, what, what did we say, at 0.1% that it was 13.82. Um, so let's just draw that in somewhere. So here's the 1% cutoff. These are just cutoffs. These critical values are just cutoffs. These are just null cutoffs. And that's the 5%. Beyond that, you'd have a p-value of five per less than 5%. Here's the 0.1 cutoff, 0.1%. That's 0.001 right? And that's the chi-squared critical value is 13.82. So we know ours is less than that, so we're rejecting this null big time. If the null was true, we'd just see this once in a blue moon. Very, very, very rare event. So well beyond the reasonable doubt, our p-value, the doubt is so tiny, you know, we're going to reject. So we reject the null. So where should I write this? 
Um, we can just say reject null. Because P is almost 0%. So we can reject it certainly at the 0.1% level. And conclude that at least one of our slopes And can go with the alternative right here that at least w that we have some significance here. This model has a signal in it that's predicting whether people get into med school or not. It's telling us something. And conclude at least one slope is significant. All right. So now we're ready to test the individual slopes, and we're going to do that with z tests. So let's do that. And it's already done for you right here. But let's just go through it. To test whether the individual slopes are significant, we do z tests, not t, because we're doing counts. State the null and alternative for each slope. Calculate the z-score and the p-value. It's already done, but let's just check it. All right, our h not. Now we're just looking at one slope, so we don't have to. We can use z tests. We don't have to use chi-square tests. We can just do a simple z, which makes it easier for us. Okay, so we'll do it for gender first. Let's do the gender slope first. That one. And what is it? It's We're saying even though we see this in our sample, this slope, that in our population, beta 1 is equal to 0. Okay? And our alternative is what? Why am I switching these alternatives? Sorry, I'm not being consistent. Sometimes I use a capital A and sometimes I use a small a. I should be consistent. People use either one, but I should be consistent. All right, and this next one is what? Now, I, I think I'll do two-sided because, why? Because it's two-sided because we didn't really know, we didn't state our uh, hypothesis ahead of time. Because I wasn't sure whether, at this point I'm not sure whether it's going to favor males or females. Because we didn't state hypothesis ahead of time. What we thought it was going to be before we looked at the data. You know, I'm just not sure which direction it's going to go to. Okay, so let's work on this then. So what do we do? Well, z, as usual, is what? z is the usual observed slope in our sample minus the expected slope from our null, which is 0, over the standard error for the slope. Okay, so let's do that. Our observed slope is right here. That's what we got here. Um, it's this. Is 2.015. Our expected is that. We'd expect from the null, as usual. And our standard error is given to us right here. So it will be given to you. You're not going to have to compute them. So there it is. And that's how they got the C-score right here. 2.348. And they already did the p-value, but let's just check it. Okay? And we can see if it's a one-sided or two-sided p-value. So we'll just... um draw the picture here, right here. This is as a z. We expect 0. And as a z, we got 2.348. Let's look that up. 2.348.
here's 2.35. Why don't we just round to 2.35 and do 98.12. So that's 98.12 in the middle. Between, I'll just round this, round to 2.35. All right, between 2.35 and negative 2.35. All right, and negative 2.35, and that's what we got. So, what is our p value? Our p-value is going to be 100 minus 98.12. And here, let's just, just to make it more intuitive, that's what it's going to look like as a uh, z-score, but what does it look like as a slope? As a slope, we also expected zero, but our observed was 2.015. And that lines up with 2.35. We happened to get, okay? So we got on this side, but we did it two-sided, so we should include both sides. So our p-value is what? Our p-value is 100 minus 98.12, which is 1.88%. these two together. So they did a two-sided here. So they did a two-sided too. It's with it's we rounded a little bit but we got exactly the same thing. Any questions on that? Do you want me to do the other one too? It's done the same way. They also did a two-sided here. I think I wouldn't do a two-sided here because I I think it doesn't I would just divide that in half. Why? Because wouldn't, don't you think the alternative we could hypothesize ahead of time and say that we think that biological, uh, raise a higher biological science score is going to help you get in, not hurt. So we could make a directional alternative a greater than sign. Does anybody want to see me do that or can we just move on? Raise your hand if you want to see me do it. Okay, let's just move on. It's just the usual. All right. Now we're going to do confidence intervals for the slopes. Okay, so let's do that. And um, so what are they doing here? Okay, so this right here is our Z star. The, the computer is using 1.96, so that's the critical value of Z star for 95% in the middle on the normal curve. Um, so that's what they're going to be using. They're going to be building confidence intervals. We often round to two. We usually round to two. And I'll tell you which you'll, you do on the, um, if on the final, it's all multiple choice anyway. But just because we do it in our heads, we usually round to two. But I'm just going to follow the printout here. Okay. So this is just, you know this already, we've done it a zillion times. Um, what is this 95% confidence interval and why is what's happening here? And why am I running out of ink? Okay, so this is zero in the middle and on the normal curve between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96, is um, is 95% of the data. And so what we're saying is that when we reject the null or when our confidence interval doesn't include zero, it means our z fell here or here. Okay, there or there. And let's look. Yes, it fell here, and it doesn't include zero. It's not including zero. All right, we build confidence intervals for the slopes the usual way. What is our usual way? We just take the sample slope plus or minus two standard errors for the slope, and that's exactly 
what was done here. So let's just, we just took this and added and subtracted two of these to it. And subtracting two gave us that and adding gave us that. That's how we build confidence intervals for the slope. But how about for the odds ratio? We want to build a confidence interval for the odds ratio. So we have to do it in a two-step process. And that's what I'm showing here. So let's go through and do that. And it's you've already done almost the identical thing um, with uh, log transformations. All right. So let's just write this down. To build confidence intervals, we first find the endpoints of the confidence interval for the sample slope. All right, so we're going to do that first. So we're going to say a 95% confidence interval. This is for the slope right here. Is going to be just that, 2.015 plus and minus the 1.96 here. And then times the standard error. So let me just do this. There's your 1.96 and there's the standard error. Okay. And that's where they got these two numbers. So this is equal to the lower limit when you subtract 1.96 times the standard error, you get this lower limit. And here's our upper limit. So the idea is it doesn't include zero, meaning that when we went all the way, we must have landed here, somewhere beyond here, so that when we go take 1.96 times the standard error. You know, this is on the z, the z, but we'd have a um, slope here. So our two, two point, you know, it's on this picture right here, right? So if we go 1.96 times the standard error, we land, we don't capture zero. Our lower limit doesn't capture zero because we're outside. If you go one point, we're outside here. So if you multiply by 1.96, these are standard errors. 1.96, you end up here. You end up somewhere where you don't include zero. Okay, that's all that is. So that's our first step. Now our second step is what? For the we're really interested more in this odds ratio because it's so intuitive. Remember we. People don't think in terms of log odds so easily. So we want that odds ratio so we can figure out the odds. Okay, for one, comparing males to females, we want to get that odds um, of the odds ratio. Okay, which remember what it was. It was e to the two point. Okay, so here, let's just do it and you'll see. 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio for gender. So we're doing a 90, I should write this down here somewhere. Okay, so let's just write this down. What we're doing is we're making these point estimates. We got the point estimates for the slope is 2.015. This is for gender. And the point est, and then we have this estimate for the odds ratio, which is e to the 2.015 and we did that last time, we said that's 7 point, was it a 7.5? Is that what we got for the odds ratio? I think we did. Okay, 7.5. Remember last time? If you do that out, it's 7.5. Okay, so now we can't just say, okay, 7.5 plus or minus something because it's not symmetrical. What we have to do is we're going to, we have a log odds here and we exponentiate that. So we're going to exponentiate those endpoints. So we'll get e to the 0 0.331 all the way to e to the 3.696. And we get this confidence interval. 
that's going to include the 7.5, but it's certainly not going to be symmetrical around it. What is it symmetrical around? To check this, to check this right here, what you would do, if we wanted to check it, we wouldn't see that it's in the center here. We'd see whether it's the geometric mean of these two, right? So we'd see whether 1.4 times 40.29 is equal to 7.5. That's what we'd check. Okay? We're b this is our point estimate, and this is our margin of error around it. And it's not plus or minus something. It's, much, it's always much closer to the smaller one. So that's what we're doing here. So it means that we're 95% sure that the odds for females getting to medical school in this model are between the odds compared to males. We're 95% sure that the odds for females getting into med school compared to males, the odds ratio, female odds divided by male odds, is between 1.4 and 40.29. Okay? So that's, com that's hard to see. The odds ratio, not the odds. So what is that? The odds ratio. That means the odds of females getting into med school divided by the odds of males. So it's, it means that the odds ratio, it means that females have somewhere in that range one point four to forty point two nine times higher odds of getting in. Given that they have the same biological science scores as the men. I didn't write that very well. Given the same BS scores. That's what it means. Now we're going to do the same thing here for the biological science score. It's exactly the same. So we'll just take our point estimate for biological science, which is right here. Add and subtract about two standard errors, and we'll get this, and then we exponentiate those. That's all we're doing. So we can do that. Okay, so the first step is the 95% confidence interval for the slope. And that is super easy. It's 1.66 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.4629. And then we get this. Sorry, I'm doing it so long-winded. That's what we get. So we get that, which is 0 0.7525 to 2. 0.567. That's our step one. Then step two, I'll do it down here. Step two is the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio, and that's just raising these right here. All we're going to do, I could just do the odds ratio confidence interval for this. Odds ratio for BS. Why don't I just do it here? The odds ratio would be e to the 1.66, and then you just raise e to the 0 0.7525, and e to the 2.567. That's what it is. Okay? That's all I'm doing. So it's e to the 0 0.7525, e to the 2 0.567, and that's all it is. And I, when I did it, I got 2.12 all the way to 13.03. Okay, any questions on this? 
So um, now I'm going to ask you, well, let's just fill this in right here. So we th did I say this wrong too? This means that we're 95% sure that the odds of getting into med school based on this data, no, that the odds ratio, we're doing it for the odds ratio, we're 95% sure that the odds ratio is between 2.12 and 13.03. This means that what? Um, the odds of acceptance are in that range or somewhere are between 2.12 to 13.03 times higher for each additional point, each extra BS point. Given you're t comparing two people with the same sex, two men or two women. Oh boy. Okay. That's exactly what we did before. And uh, anybody have any questions on this? So now. The next question says what? The odds ratio confidence interval not containing what is the same as the slope confidence interval not containing zero and to rejecting the null that the slopes are zero. Maybe we should do this as an eye clicker. Let's go to the, to, to the eye clicker and let's do that. And um, this is, uh, you know, probably a likely question, something like this on the final. So think about it. The two-sided value for the gender slope in the logs odds equation was less than 5%, right? We got that. We just did that. So we rejected the, the null. And we can conclude that um, we concluded that the slope didn't have the 95% confidence interval for the slope did not include zero. So what do you think about the odds ratio? Do you think that does not include zero too? Or do you think that's something else? Look, we know gender is significant. We know that females are being favored, right? So, do you think that we conclude, we rejected that they have the same odds? So if you reject they have the same odds, what does that mean to have the same odds? Does that mean your odds are zero to zero? If you have the same odds, then those they have the same odds, same probability of getting in. Same odds means what? Their odds are zero? Their, their odds are one to one? Or their odds are 0.5? What do you think it means? If somebody has the same odds, you say 50-50, that's, what is that? One over one. Odds are one to one. That means they're the same, right? Doesn't mean they have zero to zero odds or point 0.5 odds to one odds. So what do you think? Okay, think about it. I gave a lot of hints. We're going to stop it. And I hope you said D. You, you did win out. D was the best. Okay. It means it does not include one. Let's write that down. Let's go to the document camera. And it's really hard to see this, but it says the odds ratio not containing one is equivalent to the slope not containing zero and to rejecting the null that the slopes are zero. Why? Well, what should we say? 
Um, well, I'll just do it. Maybe math will help. If the slope in the log odds, the slope does not contain <coughs> zero, then the odds ratio, the odds ratio, which is equal to e to the slope, does not contain e to the zero, which is one. That's the, maybe that math would help. But the idea is that the null is, remember what the null is, that there's no discrimination, that knowing somebody's gender doesn't tell you a thing about whether th they're favored to get into med school or not, okay? We're rejecting that null. We're saying that there is favoring female, right? So we're rejecting that their odds are one to one. The null would say their odds are the same. Their odds are the same. The odds ratio is the same, one to one odds. The odds of the females compared to the odds that they have the same odds. Odds ratio is odds of females over odds, odds of males. Okay? Oh, all right. Let's move on. This is the kind of thing that, look, I don't, I don't blame you at all. It's actually the hardest type of thing. These conceptual questions are harder, and you'll just, don't worry. It's just because you don't have a lot of practice with them. The more you do it, and after you do the practice exam, it's going to come to you, and I don't expect it to come to you on eye clickers. I just want you to start thinking about it. Okay, so don't feel bad, don't get worried. It will come to you the more you do these problems, I guarantee it. So, uh, here's the summary and please read it all. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to move on to these non-parametric tests. So this is the last section of our um, whole course. So, what are these non-parametric versus parametric tests? Well, the only non-parametric test you've seen so far is the re-randomization. That one was different than the others. We didn't estimate any parameters. Parametric tests are based, are involve estimating parameters, assuming some particular underlying distribution. They make um, assumptions that about the distribution that our data is sampled from, and most of the tests we've been doing, all except this re-randomization, which is a parametric test, assume all of them, we're, we're estimating those betas. Those are parameters. When we do these um, non-parametric tests, we're not estimating parameters of some underla assumed underlying distribution. Most of them assume that we're dealing with either normal populations or statistics that follow test statistics that follow normal populations or close to normal populations, like the um, Z, the chi-squared, the T, and the F. Those are the test statistics. We're assuming, we make assumptions about the underlying distributions. Even in the uh, logistic regression, we did that. We estimated those beta in the log odds equation. We assumed that the underlying distribution, our data came from some S-shaped, in, in probability form, came from some S-shaped curve that followed um, a particular distribution whose parameters we estimated. Now, in, um, what did we do in part, what was it, 14? That was uh, the data transformations. We saw how we could sometimes transform data that didn't follow these distributions into one that we had known parameters that we wanted to estimate into ones that did. So we made lopsided histograms into more normal looking histograms by either moving up or down the power line, power ladder. So when we had these long right hand tails, we used these log transformations. We didn't do this one as much, but if we had a long left hand tail, we'd go up the pa power ladder. But what if we can't do this? What if we can't and we, can, and, and the, we don't have, we don't know the distribution and we really can't think of a, um, what, what else could we do? 
Well, we, s we have two choices. One we already did. Uh, we did the re-randomization test. And what we did was we let the computer randomly sample all possible samples under the null. And we were able to compute a p-value. So what we did was we basically did computer-generated experimental um, distributions and calculated p-values from that. We didn't do any estimations of parameters. We just said, okay, if we randomly divide the data up some way over and over and over again, let's let the computer do it. That's the null. That, that, that whatever difference we see between the samples or in our, in our whatever uh, effect we see is just due to chance variation. So we let the computer did all, do all these uh, randomizations and generate empirical histograms. That's one way of doing it. So that's uh, what we did in part, what was that? That was chapter um, 41 we did that, and I think it was chapter 27 as well. That's We made those uh, empirical distributions. Let's just look to make sure. I should use this table of contents more. Okay, 41 and um, not 27, what was it? Um, Right here, 37, excuse me, the, these two. Right here and right there. Okay, so let's just, in case you wanted to review that, it's not on the test now. That's what we did here. So let's just write this. So what are we doing here? We're letting the computer randomly sample all possible samples under the null. These are very common uh, to create. So we create um, empirical. distributions. So we don't have the same assumptions, right? Or this is what we did. This is There are lots of resampling techniques like this, re-randomization techniques like this. You've probably heard of Bootstrap, Jackknife, Monte Carlo simulations. There's lots of ones where the computer's generating these um, randomizations. Now we can also transform our lopsided data into more, this is what we're going to do now, into more regular data by doing what? By replacing values with rankings. So the data becomes very uh, simple. So that's what we're going to do now. Um, so we're going to replace our actual data. Like if we, whatever numbers we had, we're going to list them from the smallest to the largest and just replace them with integers between 1 and n. What place they are. The smallest will be 1. If there are 10 numbers, the biggest would be 10. Okay. So let's just jump into it. We're going to do three types. Let's do this one today. Okay, this is going to do this one today. Let's just do this, start start this. And let's see. All right, so this is an example that comes from um, when I was teaching Stat 100 a lot. And <coughs> before I gave an exam, I used to, you know, to hundreds, thousands sometimes, people, I'd do different versions of the final. We still do this, actually, in STAT 100. And so uh, I would do different versions. So many people were taking it. I'll probably do something like that with you guys. I haven't written the finals yet. But, um, and then I have these students who take them early because I want to make sure the two versions are the same, especially with STAT 100 because a slight difference really throws people off. So, um, so pretend I got, you know, people who take it early, and I divided them randomly into two groups. And stuff like this would happen. And here you can see, I want to make sure that these two groups are the same, not just for the best students or the worst students, but for, or not just their means are the same, but really are the same for all the students. So, um, this is what, so, and I also don't want to pay that much, look at this person who got an 11. No matter which group he was in, he would have gotten an 11 because this was a person, 
it actually was from real data, who never showed up for anything. It didn't matter which version, but putting them in this group automatically is going to make this group this group look uh, like there's a big difference. And I know that's not the case. He just handed in pretty much a blank exam. So um, what we want to do when we have data like this, the first of all is really, like, why not just use a t-test? Well, even if this 11 wasn't here, I wouldn't want to do it because remember, one of the assumptions for the t test is uh, normal coming from normal distributions, and um, because our exam scores are far from normal. So we really can't use a t test, and we have a small data set. We have something like that. The 11's way down there, and a lot of people got high scores. So what are we going to do? We're just going to order these. We're going to order these from rank all, put them all together in one group. There's 7 here and 8 here. And just order them with the numbers from 1 to 15. So let's do that. The lowest one is 1. And then this one is the second one, if I put them in order. You can do that on a separate sheet of paper if you want. This is the third one. And now we have a tie. There's two 70s. So what do we do? You take, we're not going to say one is four and the other is five. They're the same, but they're using up two slots. So we take the average of four and five, 4.5 for both of them. Why don't we do it down here? We have more room. I shouldn't do it up there. Let's just do it way down here. Okay, so we started one. And here's two, three. Then we saw these two were tied, and we, instead of giving them four and a five, we're giving them both the same, because they're both the same score. That's what I say here. And then the next one is um, not five. We used up four and five, so the next one's six. The biggest one's going to be 15. We have 15 numbers, so make sure that. So now we use 6. Now what's the next one? This is 7. This is 8. This is 9. 10. Whoops, no. 10 is here. Sorry. This is 11. This is... What's next? Where's 12? This is 12, this is 13, and this is 14. All right, so those are our ranks. And then what you do is you add the ranks up. So we add all these up. And we're just going to and you add these up, and we're going to compare the ranks. So when I added that up, I got 56.5. And when I added that up, I got 63.5. So that's called the rank sum. So we get f the rank sum of group A is 56.5, and the rank sum of group B is 63.5. Now, what's useful is knowing that when you add the two groups up together, it follows this formula. Let's look at this formula. N right here is the total sample size. So. The total sample size is 15. Add 1 to it is 16. And divide by 2. And we get 8 times 15 is 120. So check that these two, this plus this, should equal 120. And they do. Now, if you forget this formula, or a nice uh, way to remember it is to just, um, it's a very intuitive way. If you add the numbers, we're just adding the numbers between 1 and n. So if you wrote all these numbers out here, 1 um, plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 plus 14 plus 15. You might know, you might discover maybe on your own the way Gas did when his teacher added him, told him to add the numbers because he was bothering her and said, uh, Add the numbers between 1 and 100, and she thought that will keep him busy the whole hour. Well, he just did it really quickly, and he said, hmm, 
1 plus 100 is 101, and there's 50 of them, so 50 times 101 is, and he said 5,050, and he was right. How did he do that? Watch. So here, you're just a simple, this formula, n plus 1, 1 plus 15, that's 16, right? That's, well, how many times are we going to do that? 2 and 14 is also 16. 13 plus 3 is also 16, etc. So if we do that half the time, 4 plus 12 is 16, 5 and 11, 6 and 10, 7, 9, 16, and then here, 8 in itself is 16. There's an odd number. So what we did was we said 15 divided by 2 times 16. And that's 120. That's where the formula comes from. So um, now we can use um, another way to look at this is thinking the average is going to be right in the middle. 16 divided by 2. That's going to be the average. And basically there's these all these numbers are just the same below average as these are the same below above. So you could say 15 times the average. So now we're going to use the z-statistic. Why can we use the z-statistic all of a sudden? Because the central limit theorem says that these rank sums, the sum of numbers from um, any distribution, as long as n is large enough, is going to uh, have a normal distribution, the sum and the average. But these, as you can see, now that we have, we've replaced these distributions with rankings, with just very simple numbers. We don't need large n for the central limit theorem to kick in. So we can use the z-stat to test the Nelsons for large enough group sa sizes. And let's just say for this class, both greater than 6. The probability distribution is very close to normal when the null is true, with these expected values and standard errors. So the expected value right here, that's the expected value is n times the average. So the expected value for the rank for group A is, that's the sample size, the sample size for the group. Times the average of all n numbers just said 8 is the average of all n numbers. So that's so it's going to be n little a times n plus 1 over 2, which is 7 times 8, which is 56. That's what it's going to be. Now, I was going to ask you this as an eye clicker, but we're running out of time, so I'll just do it here. The expected value for the rank for group B is going to be what? NB. There's eight numbers. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's going to be eight times eight, which is 64. And now the standard error formula, don't worry, this will be given to you on your final, is the same for both groups. And if you want to know the derivation of that, just shoot me an email and I can send it to you. But this will be printed on your final. So this is the square root of the two sample sizes, 7 times 8 times n plus 1, 16 over 12. And I got 8.64. So when we do this for ZA, we have our observed rank sum, which is right here. 56.5 minus our expected, which is 56, over the standard error. And we got this very, very small z-score. So let's draw it here. Here's as a z, and let's draw it as a rank sum. We expect 56. And we got 56.5. So this is where 56.5 lines up. As a z, it's right there. 
And as a rank sum, that's our observed. That's our observed, and this is our expected. This is as our rank sum for group A. So we can just do, use the normal curve, and I look this up, 0 0.58. And, sorry, too many extra pages. Um, I'm just going to round it to that, okay? To 4% in the middle about, to the nearest line. And now we go back, sorry. <laughs> right here. So this is 4%. Now our p-value is huge. It's two-sided here. We didn't say which group was going to be bigger or smaller. So our p is equal to 100 minus 4%, which is 96%. So we cannot reject the null, thank God. I didn't want to reject the null. I want the two exams to be as like as possible. The two exam forms, not only are their means are the same, it's a stronger null, but that the exam forms come from the same distribution. So not only their means are the same, but their distributions are the same. Or, which is exactly what I wanted, because I, w I want the exams to be the same. Now you could do the other one the exact same way. You could do the Z for the B, and you'd get exactly the same thing. You'd get 63.5, the observed, minus 64 over, it has the same thing, the same standard error. All I'm doing is saying 63.5 minus 64 over 8.64, and then I just get the opposite. So the p-values will be the same. So zb is equal to the opposite of za, same p-values. Now I'm going to quickly show you in the last five minutes that there's another way to do this using a u statistic that I actually like even better. And so what does the u statistic do? You'll get the same p-values, the same z-scores, but what you do, it's useful because there's a u-chart. Um, that um, the tables that we're going to be using, if we don't do the z, if we want to do exact probability distributions, are in terms of u. So what do we do? For each number in group A, count how many numbers in group B it outscores. Pretend these are two teams, and each player here plays each one of these. So for how many times does 11 outscore this? Does 11 outscore anybody? No. So he'd earn zero points for his team, 70. This person, he has plays all these players, so what would he earn? He'd beat him, one point, two points, and he'd tie. Count ties as a half. So this guy would earn 2.5. How about 75? How many people would he beat? One, two, three. He outscores three of them, so he contributes three points to the, to the team. How about 85? One, two, three, four, five. Same with 88. He'd beat those same people, so those both... I'm adding these. So those both contribute 5. So how about 92? How many he beats everybody, including 90? So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 96, everybody except these, except 100. So that's 7. Now we'll do these. 60 only beats one person. I know 100 beats everybody, all 7 of them. right? 65 just beats 1. 70 beats 1 and a half, ties him. 79 beats 3. 81 also outscores 3. 90 outscores 5. And 94 outscores 6. So we add all those up and we get a 27.5. Add all these up and we get a 28.5.
All right. Now, questions on that? Does that make sense? What's the lowest you could get here? If everybody had, if there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lowest numbers, we're all on this side, they'd get a zero. And the seven, if the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight highest numbers were on this side, they'd each get seven. So eight times seven is 56, and that is the total. Um, there's, note, if you add these two together, 28.5 plus 27.5, what do we get? We get NA, all seven players on this team, play each of those eight, so it's seven times eight, which is 56 pairwise comparisons. There's six, there's 56 matches. So they have to sum to 56. All right, so now what's the expected value? We can use a Z stat to test the null. What's the expected value? They're going to be the same. The expected value is that this team's going to win half and this team's going to be win half. Even if there's only one person on this team played all the others, he'd win half the time. So out of the 56 matches, half is going to go to this and half is going to go to that. So the expected value for UA is equal to the expected value for UB, which is just equal to 7 times 8 over 2 which is 28. And lo and behold, we've got the same standard error. So nice. So now we can just do the statistics, and you'll see that they are the same. The observed UA, we'll do it for, a, for this one, watch, 28.5 minus the expected. And you <coughs> look, you've got that same difference of 0 0.5 that we got here. This is 0 0.5, we're going to have the same standard error, so you're going to get the same p-value. This is the same p standard error. 7 in one group, 8 in the other, times 16 over 12, and that's 8.64. It's no surprise that they have it the same, because they just differ by this constant, by a constant. They're just shifted over. These are just smaller. It's just the curve shifted over. Okay, so now this is over 8.64, and we get exactly the same z-score. This right here is 0 0.058, okay? So we can mark it here. And it's exactly the same. Of course, we don't expect, z you know, we have a different expected. We have a 28 here. And this is z, and this is the u counts. All right? So our conclusion is we get the same 4% and the same exact thing. So p, again, is 4% is 100 minus 4%, which is 96%. So it's the same. Cannot reject the null. All right. And again, if we did the other one, we'd just get 27.5 um, minus 28. And ZB is equal to, this is ZA, ZB is equal to 27.5 minus 28 over 8.64, which is negative 0 0.058. All right, so the idea is ZA is equal to the opposite of ZB, and they have the same p-values and z-scores as the rank sum. Okay, so next time we'll start right here, and I'll show you how to do this chart, how to read this chart. And just so you know, we're going to skip this and skip this. So all we have left to do next time, we'll have a review, and all we have left to do next time is two half pages. 
page, two pages, 20, 221 and 222. That's all we have left to do. And we'll have a review next time, too.